Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. So a few years ago, I got in the mail this book called Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. It has a really cool vintage aesthetic to it. It looks like something you'd pick up from the 19th century, full of vintage engraving illustrations of Winston Churchill or Teddy Roosevelt, and then with these life lessons on how to be a man from these great figures from history. Anyways, the book author is named Stephen Mansfield, and I brought him on the show to discuss his manly maxims and his ideals of manhood that he espouses in the Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. Man, it's a lot of manly there. Anyways, this book is uh, geared towards Christian men, but I think the ideas and principles that he talks about in there are applicable to a man of any faith uh, or lack of faith. But uh, on the podcast today, Stephen and I discuss some of the unique questions or challenges of manliness and Christianity, how the two can can be congruent, and why Christian churches have such a hard time uh, keeping a man's attention and getting them actually into the pews and what churches can, what they should be doing to remedy that. And then after that, we start talking about just the manly maxims of, of Stevens Mansfield and the ideals and what we can learn from great men from history to live a, a more manful life. Uh, so really interesting uh, podcast. I think a lot of great takeaways. You'll think you'll feel a little invigorated and inspired and feel a bit more virile after you're done listening. So without further ado, Stephen Mansfield and Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. All right, Stephen Mansfield, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. All right, so your book is Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, and it's a great book. And the thing to start off with, it's, it's directed primarily towards a Christian audience, though I think a man of any faith or no faith could get something out of it. But let's, I think it's interesting, this whole Christian angle, because I think it's a great topic of discussion, the intersection of Christianity and masculinity, because it's something that my friends and I discuss quite a bit. It seems that the church has had a hard time reaching and resonating with men. What is it, the way that Christianity is portrayed, that puts a lot of men off? Well, you know, there's a natural drift in most Christianity towards the feminine, towards uh, emotional experiences, uh, towards intensely internal things, uh, towards even intellectual things, which doesn't inherently mean non-manly, but uh, it can in some cultures. And and so if, if we're not careful, if we don't run our churches with, in a man-friendly way and realize that uh, men are critical to the whole process, then, yeah, we, we, we can turn churches into very feminine situations. And that's why, uh, you know, the stats show that about 70 to 80 percent of most church attendance is by women. Yeah, and this isn't a new problem either. Um, I think it's fascinating as I've done read books from the 19th century about masculinity. Um, most of the books were Christian books. Uh, and they were basically authors were trying to make the case to men that, yes, indeed, Christianity is manly and Christ was a manly figure and we should emulate him. Um, so I think, I think it's fascinating that this problem that's been around since 100 years and more is still going on today. Uh, there's no question. You know, I, I'm sitting in my office in Nashville as we speak, and I'm looking across my desk here at a book called Manhood at Harvard. Uh, it's about a movement that happened right around the 1900, dawn of the 1900s, with men like Theodore Roosevelt involved. It was a great surge of masculinity. Uh, it produced a lot of his great works and, and other leaders out of Harvard and Yale. Uh, you know, this is described in a book by Ann Douglas that maybe you've read. It's called The Feminization of American Culture, and uh, she's a Columbia a scholar, and basically she says that when the pulpit, when the churches uh, turned liberal and thus turned feminine, uh, and she makes that connection, not me, um, that it lost manhood. It lost a vision for manhood, and then it started losing men from the pews. So that's, you know, that's a fascinating connection that we have to consider, but the, the bottom line is you're absolutely right. I mean, when uh, initially uh, Christianity was seen as a, a spur to manhood, but by the time we get into the early 1900s, that's been lost. Yeah, and the, yeah, the whole muscular Christianity movement, where the YMCA yes. and Billy Sunday wrestling with the devil. Uh, I love that stuff. It's it's, it's a Me really too. fascinating part of our history. So, okay, so here's the question. What what can churches do to connect more with men? Because, you know, I'm in Oklahoma. Uh, we have a lot of the big mega churches around here, Life Church, uh, Church on the Move. And I've seen some of the things they've done to reach out for men. And it's like, have like a Harley Davidson night, um, Super Bowl Sunday, and like incorporate football into the sermon. And for some men that really resonates, but I've had some of my friends who go to these churches where they sort of roll their eyes and they feel sort of patronizing. Um, what can men do, or what can churches do to connect more with men? 
Well, you know, I celebrate anything the churches can do that draw them in. So if a Super Bowl does it or, you know, the breakfast on Saturday morning, that's fine. But I think I, I, I'm with you. I think a lot of that can tend to be, um, you know, like having a soap opera party for women. I think women would not be all that happy about that either. Um, the, the bottom line is we need to understand the nature of men. Uh, men uh, are not uh, engaged simply by processing emotions and uh, sitting and contemplating things. They're engaged by doing. You know, they, they have uh, – they've done a number of studies over the years where they'll put children, male and female, in a room with chairs and toys, and they basically let them do what they want, and they observe them. The girls turn the chairs just opposite each other, look at each other, and finally one of them says, you know, I like your hair. And then uh, the guys, though, turn the chairs side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and the little boys will start looking around and saying things like, hey, I bet we can climb up on that cabinet. Hey, I wonder how we can pull her hair. I wonder if we can set that door on fire, you know, or whatever. How much, how much dynamite does it take to blow up the cat? I mean, they start thinking of things to do. So I think this is a key to how men think. Throughout the Old Testament, whenever a man is commanded to teach his son, there's always a phrase in there like, you know, on the way, while you're walking, as you're going, while you're doing things. So to circle men up in a fellowship hall and say, process your emotions and check on each other is, is uh, not the optimal way, the best way to do it. Uh, the best, best way to engage men is to have them connect and build manly relationships as they're doing significant things, uh, as they're doing things they care about. It's in the doing, I think, that men really come to the fore. So that's a major difference, and if churches would pay attention to that, I think it, it would make a, a big difference. There's one other thing I'll mention briefly, and that is uh, that you know the ma- vast majority of most church staffs are female, uh, about 80%. And where pastors have decided to change that, not to go anti-female at all, but to make sure there's there are prominent manly men, so to speak, uh, on the staff, in the administration, in every kind of position, uh, it you know people become what they behold. The church will change in its composition uh, if the leadership has a lot of. Uh, of really engaged men in it. And so that's that's been a major tactic, too. Okay, so be action-oriented as opposed to emotions or feelings-based. Yes, exactly. And I, I, think, I think that, you know, since our churches have tended in recent decades to turn a little bit therapeutic, a lot of what passes for a men's ministry is men circled up talking about each other's emotions. And I, that, that, that may last for a short while. It won't carry us long term, and it won't make us the kind of people who are changing society. And uh, that's why I celebrate a lot of what you do, because, you know, it's about uh, getting men connected, yes, but also getting them busy doing the right things. Yeah, I've been to a few of those men's fellowship things in the morning. The donuts were good. But, like, yeah, it, it, the, <laughs> like I, 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 I gave it, like, a sh- you know a couple weeks, and I was like, I just stopped going because I just felt like I'm not getting anything out of this. And I don't yeah, know. It, was, not, it wasn't invigorating, I guess. Exactly, exactly. I consider myself a, a pretty manly guy. I hope I am. I'm, I'm, I'm okay on, on football and watching football. I don't hunt. I'm not interested in motorcycles. I'm a city boy. Um, you know, there, there got to be other ways to go. So really, the key is to know your culture, know your men, uh, and, and build in that direction. But keep in mind, uh, I'm saying this to all pastors, all leaders. Keep in mind that the basic nature of men which is processing the eternal, sitting around and thinking thoughts, is not the best way to engage them. We've got to set them in motion. Okay. So let's get to your book. Um, And I love how you begin your book. You talk about a moment when you were in Damascus. And this is when you were a grown man, uh, and you had children. And you said that was the night you became a man. Can you recount that story for our listeners? I think it's a really cool story. Well, thanks, and I can. Uh, I was part of a relief team that was going in and out of Iraq to work with the Kurds back some years ago. And on one of my trips, my papers got messed up and I got stuck in Damascus. And uh, I was there pretty much alone. There was a Syrian parliamentarian, this is back before Syria you know, ended up in the mess that it's in now, um, who knew I was there. He was a Christian. He uh, was concerned that I was alone and, you know, just tr- every day trying to get my papers filed right. And he finally decided to have a little gathering on the roof of a hotel in Damascus. Well, he invited a bunch of uh, Arabs, of course, who could hardly speak English. I don't speak any Arabic. And we sat around, we ate, we nodded at each other, we said what little we could say. And finally, uh, one of the guys uh, turned to me in broken English and said, do you have a son? I said, I do. He said, what is his name? And I said, it's Jonathan. And as though he was announcing, you know, something miraculous in the room, he said, well, then you have a new name. Everybody stopped and looked at him. 
He said, your name is Abu John. Well, it turns out that in Arab culture, when a man has a son, it's considered such an honorary thing, such an amazing thing for him, that he's given an honorary name, an honorific, they call it in Arabic. And um, they, what it means is that uh, they take uh, the word Abu, which means father, and they put it with a shortened version of the son's name, and that's the honorary title uh, for the father from that point on. So my son's name is Jonathan, and they started calling me Abu John. Well, that was sweet to know, but the next thing that happened was these guys realized I had I did not know that. They had never celebrated that with me. Um, and so they began the manliest partying that I've ever been a part of. Uh, they brought out food, they turned up the music, they started dancing, some of them had Uzis in their hands, you know, and when a, when a guy's got an Uzi in his hand and, he, and he's dancing with you, he leads, you know, so we danced and we danced, and uh, and finally about in the wee hours of the morning, they they kind of backslapped me back to my hotel and uh, wished me well, but they had spent hours celebrating me as a father. Well, I have to tell you, at that time, I was in my mid-30s, finishing a doctorate, had a wife, two children, obviously a son, um, had lived a pretty normal American life, military brat, you know, football, baseball, baseball, basketball, lived all over the place. I had never in my entire life been celebrated as a man. There had never been a moment when men said, we know who you are, we know what this means, whatever it is, you know, becoming an adolescent, going to college, marrying, whatever it is. There had never been a ritual in my life that had uh, sort of commemorated and deepened the experience of some of some passage from one stage to another. And so here are these, these Muslim guys in Damascus, Syria, some of them probably terrorists for all I know, I mean, I, didn't, I couldn't even talk to them, dancing and celebrating me as Abu John, it profoundly changed me. You know, I'm a Protestant Christian, I'm not Jewish, we don't have a bar mitzvahs, we don't have any ceremonies for manhood, um, and i got to tell you, that really began to make me realize that you know we're not we're not recognizing we're not helping boys grow we're not commi- we're not marking these transitions with men and i'm always reminded when i tell the story of the african proverb uh from the villages that says if we do not initiate the boys they will burn the village down and that's very much what's happening in our society and i wasn't in any danger of burning anybody's ha- buildings or village but i definitely was a man with an aching empty soul when it came to manhood and that was the turning point for me so I mean, that's a great point that one of the problems, there's lots of problems that are facing men today, is the, the sort of lack of a rite of passage. Um, what's the solution to that? Because there's lots of organizations and groups out there that sort of provi- that provide rites of passage experiences. Is that the solution where you sort of you go to this organization or you go to, the, or does it need to be more organic, right? Like within the family or within a man's, I don't know, tribe, if you want to call it, whether that's their church or their close group of friends, like how do you incorporate a rite of passage into your culture? Well, I I think it does have to be done first informally. In other words, the father, the immediate men around a boy, around a young man needs to take responsibility for it. It doesn't have to be highly organizational or even even liturgical or ceremonial. Um, You know, when my son was about to turn 13, uh, we had what we called a Christian bar mitzvah for him. We had people in who knew him and said positive things about him. We gave him a sword. But before that, I just drove up with him into the mountains. We had a big old sex talk along the way. We listened to some tapes by some uh, some wise psychologists who were talking to young boys. And, uh, you know, we went up in the mountains and we swam naked. We ate, you know, junk food until four in the morning and we watched old movies and, and we just had a great time. I think he considers both of them to have been the marking of his passage into adolescence. I tried to do the same thing when he uh, went to college, and he's not married yet, but when he is, I'll, I'll do the same thing then. So what we can do is simply start shifting some of these moments that we recognize as transitional moments uh, you know, into ha- having an emphasis on manhood. He, even, you know, I got married and had children. No one ever talked to me as a man, celebrated me as a man or a father. And I think that uh, we can we can certainly do that. But then I'm, I certainly welcome uh, more ceremonial approaches and churches, men's organizations, shoot, even amongst a, a few friends or in a business. You know, there's, there's, there's certainly anything that we do that confirms a man, confirms his journey, calls out the best in him, and points him towards a valiant future, maybe gives him some symbols, some lasting things he can keep that, that speak of all that, I, I think it, can, it will really change lives. And we know the value of ceremony, but you know, we shouldn't have to be in the military or the Boy Scouts you know, or a highly liturgical church to, uh, to have these moments. Okay. So be proactive, be intentional. Yes. You lay out what you call your manly maxims. There are four of them. What are those four manly maxims that sort of guide the rest of your book? 
Well, I wanted to give men a, a simple on-ramp for, for masculinity if they didn't have one. The first one is manly men do manly things. Now, of course, I'm having some fun with this. We call them Mansfield's manly maxims. But the, the first one is manly men do manly things. And the idea is simply to get men focused on the doing. Uh, I'm a little concerned that a lot of our emphasis on men and our programs and ministries and what have you uh, really focuses on the emotional. And men retreat from that. You know, I've had guys say to me when I invite them to one of our you know, gatherings, do we have to hug? and stuff. You know, they're just afraid somebody's going to grab them and look in their eyes and sing Kumbaya or whatever. And so what what I want to do is get them focused on the doing. Um, The second one is that manly men tend their field. The thing they're doing is tending their field. Now, this is language that comes from the Apostle Paul when he said, uh, you, you know, I, I, I know the field assigned to me. I know what God's given me to do. And I start asking men, what are you responsible for? What are you, have you been given to do? Because the opposite of great manhood is that you are irresponsible, that you're sitting in your you know, recliner while the house falls apart. You're neglecting your wife who's bitter and gaining weight, the kids who are doing things they ought not be doing, and everybody's lonely and hurting. Well, this is, this is your responsibility. And I think men grow in strength, authority, wisdom, uh, and certainly honor when they take responsibility. Um, the third one is, is really the one that really galvanizes in my mind, and that is that manly men build manly men. In other words, I'm all for seminars, conferences, books, every kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, I think that m- noble, righteous manhood gets built into a man when he has a band of brothers. And uh, I think you, you, every man's got to have a band of brothers, and there's got to be in those, among those band of brothers a free fire zone where anything can be said that needs to be said to make me better, and I'll do the same for you. Now, my band of brothers, we have a lot of fun along the way. We do a lot of rowdy things. We do a lot of social service things, but we make each other better, and there's a free fire zone. And then finally, my fourth one is that manly men live to the glory of God. I, I'm of the opinion uh, that a man really can't do what he's made to do, do it well, do it powerfully, uh, on his own strength. He's got to have the, the gift of God, the grace of God, the guidance of God, the counsel of God uh, to do what he does. And so those are the four, and they're not everything a man needs to know, but at least they're the on-ramp that I think helps most men get up and running. Yeah, I, I, the one, the two that really stuck out to me, I mean, all of them are great, um, was the, the tending your fields. I never thought of it responsibility in that that light and i love the metaphor um and then also the yeah, the importance of of building other men up because i think uh, one of the problems in our our modern culture is it's very self-centered right uh but like it's not in a it's yeah we're all about self-actualization self-improvement and then we forget the other and then in my experience maybe this is your experience too that i've always become a better person whenever i'm serving others Right. I, it's, for some reason, it gives me more motivation to improve myself when I feel like I'm building someone else up. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I think that what we've done is we've defined this issue of destiny and becoming what we're supposed to be or what we want to be uh, in terms of a very self-focused process, like you say. But I tell men, look, you have a destiny, but your destiny is fulfilled by investing in the destinies of others. I mean, this is this is the truth of almost every great religion. It's the truth of uh, certainly what I believe as a Christian. It's the truth that I see practically lived out around me. Um, I don't get better by you know getting in a room by myself and focusing on myself and looking in the mirror and you know just doing doing things to build up myself. I get better as a man as I invest in other men, as I invest in my son, my daughter, my wife. As I as I man the boundaries of the field assigned to me sacri- sacrificially if necessary, so I, I couldn't agree more. And that, that's why even in Scripture, for example, we we see so many examples and direct statements where you know if a man's going to be a good man to his wife, he's going to have to lay down his life. I mean, this is the pattern. So the, you're absolutely right. The the self focus of our age, our society, I think works against great manhood. All right. So you you have a chapter where you it's, the title is from a famous line from the Bible. And it's an exchange between King David of Israel. He's about to die, and he's giving his final blessings on his children. And he tells his son Solomon to be strong and show yourself a man. What does it mean to show yourself a man, and how can men do that today? Well, first of all, just taking a little bit of information about that verse, you know, there are very few times in the Bible when the word man means uh, the characteristics of a man, the nobility of a man, the good things a man ought to be doing, and not just males. And that's one of them. David didn't turn to Solomon and say, be a male. He said, be a good, a righteous, a noble man. And I think that the beginning of it is very much what you and I are discussing. I think a man needs to recognize that he's put on earth for certain purposes, and his own pleasure and personal fulfillment is not it. 
alone, and that he needs to invest in the lives of others, uh, build a manly culture, bring up the boys around him, and not just his own, by the way, but others, uh, in that manly culture, and begin to do good in the world. When men really begin to understand the gift that it is to be a man, and invest that gift in society, in the young, in their wife, in noble causes, that's when I see men really engage. And other things start to get easier. It's like, it's like, it's like you're grabbing the ski rope, and once you grab the ski rope and you're, you're balanced on the skis, now things start moving forward. Before that, you were just plowing water. And a lot of guys are, are plowing water, but they're not, they're not really up and moving quickly and, 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 and engaged. When they make this critical change and begin to realize that manhood is a power Powerful thing, but it has to be invested in others to really have its power fulfilled, its purpose fulfilled. Uh, that's when men become noble, when they become great men, and it's 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 absolutely wondrous to behold. Okay, so the the rest of your book, after you lay out your man, manly maxims, sort of this road, this on ramp, and then this ideal of showing ourselves or shoeing. I love the the King James version of show shoe. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's our goal. You you dedicate a chapters to virtues or ideals that we should aspire for. And what I love about it is that you, you take a famous person or famous man from history and look at his life and, and how that individual represented that ideal and what lessons we can take from that. And you include like all my, my all-time favorites, and, and one of them uh, is Winston Churchill. What virtues or ideals of manhood can Churchill teach us today? Well, in, in all the book, I, what I wanted to do was take some of our heroes and show the dark side of their lives and yeah. how they overcame that. In other words, I, I, I love celebrating these guys and could have written you know, real positive, happy chapters, but I decided to go to the dark side. And with Churchill, uh, perhaps the most uh, damaging, potentially deforming thing in his life uh, was that his father hated him. People often don't know this. Uh, his father was descending into uh, a form of madness throughout most of Churchill's young life, um, probably induced by a disease of some kind. Um, but Churchill was simply a disappointment to his father, even as, if his father had not been in some kind of medical condition. And uh, Churchill's father treated him horribly. Um, and so Churchill lived in his shadow, lived in fear of him, uh, lived wounded by this man. And uh, later in life, uh, Churchill literally thought that he, his father was appearing to him um, and taunting him even when he was prime minister of England. But what I find powerful about the whole thing is that when, when uh, Lord Randolph, Churchill's father, died, uh, Churchill had to make a decision. Am I going to live now in bitterness and regret and let that define my life, or am I going to live out my father's legacy? Am I going to pick up his discarded legacy, so to speak, because uh, Lord Randolph ended his life pretty much in some shame and, and, and you know, popular disrepute? Um, or, or, or Churchill had to think, will I live out his legacy or will I just be crushed under it? And he decided, uh, as, as he wrote in his book, My Early Life, uh, that he would take up his father's legacy and cause and live it. And he did that publicly for the rest of his life. And I think that's a very defining moment in Churchill's life. There are a number of them, as you know. But um, when he decides not to be bitter, not to be angry, not to live a life of regret and snarling anger, but to live out his father's legacy and see, him as, see himself as a champion of his father's cause, I think that's when Churchill takes major steps up towards what he would become. And we all know that many men, you know, and certainly in my own life, I could, I could choose to, others could choose to uh, allow bitterness towards their fathers to crush them. Um, but that's a major defining issue right there. How will you live out a sense of family destiny? How will you extend your father's cause in the world? And I think that's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that defines a great man. Yeah, I love the whole idea of like, connection to family. In a way, even if your your family, you're not there's nothing to really be proud of about your family. In a you know, maybe there's some some skeletons in your family's closet, but using that right, like, like like Churchill did to sort of go against that and like I'm going to do something different. I don't have I'm not trapped by this. I can take my family's legacy and make it something different. Uh, I think is really inspiring. Well, that, that's what I've had to do in my own life, even. Um, I don't have the, near the level of abuse in my life that Churchill did. I come from a long line of military commanders, fairly high-ranking military commanders in the American military, and uh, they were all terrible fathers, I just have to say. Love them as I do, they were all terrible fathers. And I've, I've sat many times with my children and said, listen, 
you know, what we can receive from these men is not just, you know, pride in their accomplishments and their medals and their rank, but we can receive the, the sense that we have a family called to fight in noble causes. We have a, uh, we have a family that, that, that really is charged with living for uh, something passionate, maybe having to sacrifice for it. Well, man, my kids eat that up. It's not, it's not something I'm just making up. Uh, I really believe that you know that's what's passed on to them, and then I explain to them that you know it, it, within the soil of your of, of your greatness are the seeds of your destruction, so to speak, and and uh, and that these these guys weren't great parents. So my kids, none of them are married yet; they're too young. But um, but I'm telling you, they are ready to be great parents and to overcome sort of the negative family history. So uh, you know you usually can find even in a troubled family something to pass on to the next generation and something to live out yourself. And I think that's again the the, the great benefit of Churchill's example. So in the next, one of the chapters, you make a case that men need to learn or relearn the skill of friendship. Why are friends so important in a man's life, and why is it so difficult for grown adult men to make friends? You know, it's one of the great questions of our age. I think that most men simply, uh, friends, friendships happen so naturally in early life that unless someone teaches them how to build friends, how to build a band of brothers, the priority and importance of it and the skills of it, then they just sort of uh, outgrow their friends in a sense. I don't mean that they, they wouldn't benefit from them. Most of us have friends when we were in high school, you know, before, uh, playground friends, up to sports college, it's fairly easy, you know, you're in dorms, you're going to class with people. But then most guys get married, have children, get busy, and a decade later, they, you know, a friend is someone you call once a year, if you, if you call at all. Um, most guys don't have those skills. But men are, are, are need other men, number one. Uh, they, they are, most of what they're made to do, they are not made to do alone. Women bond quickly, easily. Uh, those, those the relationships are meaningful. Uh, women then can function alone, usually better than men, uh, most of the studies show. But men need other men. They need the, the reflections of other men. They need the insights of other men. Um, and, and I think that our society just isolates um, and causes a man to turn towards his entertainments for whatever manly input he's getting rather than to other men. So to shut off the TV and the devices, to build a band of brothers, uh, to do noble things, and to create that free fire zone where men are uh, speaking into each other's lives, what they need to know to be great men. I, I think that's just essential. I mean, where do you start? I mean, can you, do you start at church? Do you, if you don't have a church, like, can you go to work? I mean, how do you find these other men? Well, most men are in a sea of casual relationships. And so that the art of this thing is to take the relationships you have at whatever level and move them towards relationships that are beneficial to each other. Uh, and then include discussion of, of the serious matters of what it means to be a man. I, as I teach men how to do this, it's usually just a matter of starting to turn the topics that are discussed in light conversation over lunch at work or, you know, the basketball game once in a while, or whatever, turn the discussion, turn it to, uh, you know, what do you think about this? I'm, I'm struggling with it. What do you think about that? How do you overcome that? Have you ever had to battle that? Just turn it from the, some of the caca we tend to discuss, you know, just, in, just to buy the time and deepen them a little bit and to see, to see who responds. And if a guy responds, well, then now you may, you may be moving from friendship to a real brother. Um, you know, keep doing things, keep having fun, but, but see if this person won't partner with you in the great project of being a man. And sometimes your own transparency is the best way to do this. You know, uh, you know, I'm really, man, I'm on, I'm on the porn all the time. Have you ever, have you had to overcome that? Have you had to battle that? Or, you know, I've, I'm really, I'm just eating myself to death here, man. Can, well, how do you stay trim? And, and, you know, how do you break through the whole lethargic man thing? You know, and just, just start to, to get enlist people and purposes. Most men want to bond. They want to help their friends. They want to be tight. We've just simply lost the skills. So it takes one guy, I think, uh, starting to turn the friendships he has at a very light level towards something deeper and meaningful. And then I think it starts to take on a life of its own. Okay. So I was pleasantly surprised to find humor on your list um, because in running the site, you know, we hit some really serious topics and we, we were really serious and in, in, in earnest about helping men become better men in their lives. But every now and then we'll do something that's just fun. And when we do these fun things, you always have like the sourpuss, like church lady types who are just like, no, you, you need to be serious. And like being, you know, manhood is a serious topic and you, sh you shouldn't joke around. And it's just like a buzzkill. Uh, but I love how you use GK Chesterton one of my favorite writers to sort of exemplify this ideal of humor. Why is humor important in a man's life? 
Well, a man communicates a great deal through his humor, and we not only need to lighten up and see the humorous side. Churchill said if we can't see the humorous side of life, we're not going to be able to deal with the most serious side of life. Uh, but but I, I really think that uh, for most men, more is caught than is taught in the sense of humor. A little boy falls, skins his knees, crying. His father says, you know, did you kick that sidewalk? Don't kick that sidewalk. The kid stops crying. He, you know, starts to laugh, and then we can go to mom and get the medicine. I mean, this is the way men are. We comfort each other. We encourage each other. Um, I've been in Iraq during the war listening to soldiers talk, and they're always talking smack and humor. It's about lightening the load. It's about saying we're going to be okay. So, so uh, one of the philosophers said that humor is the way we explore the difference between way, the way things are and the way they ought to be. And uh, I think that's what men do inherently with humor. Well, when, when they start to get into hyper-serious situations and start to get talked out of their humor, I think it's evidence that they're losing their souls, they're losing their groove, they're losing uh, who they are on the inside. And so um, I think you're absolutely right. We don't need church lady men. We need men who, you know, know how to be serious and do, do things in a focused way, but know how to play, talk smack, tease each other, encourage each other, and break up some of the hyper-seriousness that keeps us from really being the best we can be. Um, so you include the virtue of wildness or being wild. And what's interesting because a lot of when you go to church, there seems to like, you know, they de-emphasize that. Like, no, you gotta be calm and meek and, you know, nice and don't 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 be wild. That's 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 what we're trying to get rid of. Uh, but you make the case that no, you know, men if they want to be good men need to harness their wild side. Why is that? Well, I th- I think men are made for confrontation, for controlled violence. Uh, you know, men, we all know, you put three men in a, in a break room uh, and close the door, they're going to fold up a piece of paper and turn it into a f- triangular football and wreck the room and play in a football game. Men need to bark at the moon. They, they need to blow something up. They need to pee in the sink. They need to be outside the boundaries. And uh, I think that most men need some controlled wildness. By that, I mean they don't need to go crazy and kill themselves hanging off a mountain, but some controlled wildness in their lives. Um, It keeps us alive. It keeps us awake. And in a church situation, I have to say it's a little bit weird that we go to church uh, to worship Jesus. This is the same Jesus uh, who was a carpenter who got furious and flipped tables and made a whip to drive people out of his father's temple. You know, he was a man of passion. He wept. Um, I, I can just see him walking along the Sea of Galilee, dumping Peter into the water, and then starting a the free-for-all. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think we've got the wrong image of Jesus as a guy in a bathrobe with a sheep under his arm, and that's why we all think that religion is just, you know, behave yourself. Um, but really, I think the Spirit of God in us and the example of Jesus wants us uh, to know how to be passionate, and fully engaged, and fully throttled, full throttle, and that's why... Um, you know, having some, some wildness in your life, having some confrontation, um, you know, hitting hard. I think that's, that's something we should never lose. And I love how you use Teddy Roosevelt to exemplify that. Yeah, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is, is a great example for men to read about. But, you know, his mother and his wife died in the same house on the same day. Yeah. And he was devastated. And how did he recover himself? Uh, he he had a little property out in the Dakota Territories, and he went out there and basically lived as a cowboy um, for the better part of two years. And uh, it restored something in his soul. And, and every historian, and Roosevelt himself, says he would never have been what he became um, if he hadn't had that time recovering himself in wildness. And I, I think men are overly domesticated, and we suffer for it. Yeah, I love that idea of getting out into the, like, actually getting out into nature, getting into the wilderness. Like, not only T- Teddy Roosevelt did that, um, who said that being out, kind of taking a sojourn in the wilderness was beneficial. Uh, Jack London, uh, he said that, that he's kind of in a funk, and he went out into the Dakotas, or not the Dakotas, Alaska, to go pan for gold. And he said that he found himself in the wilderness. Uh, Jesus, you know, started his ministry, went to the wild. Yes, yes that's so, exactly right. So there's something about that. Um, so hmm, that's like a post that I need to write. Um, <laughs> so you also, you, I thought this was interesting, you included suffering as an ideal or virtue. Why, what, what is it that about suffering or embracing it that can help us become better men? Well, we're living in a generation where the hardship of life itself is seen as an evil. But, but men really improve through hardship. Hardship's the price of things. I mean, none of us liked, you know, the harder parts of football practice or baseball practice or, you know, whatever we were doing. None of us, none of us like having to do those hard things, but that's how we improve. And so if we don't see suffering as a, 
as something that that is part of life, then we're going to be in trouble and we're going to we're going to shy away from it. But but embracing suffering, throwing yourself into suffering, realizing that a person's suffering times are his best improving times, as one philosopher said, uh, that's that's how we grow. And I, I think men have a special gift from that. Uh, I have to say, when I go to the weight room, uh, when I see guys, you know, working hard, doing extreme sports, uh, it's it's like something comes together in a man's soul when he has a struggle and a battle. And uh, so, so to so to convince ourselves that that pleasure and comfort is the ultimate goal, and to be shocked and offended by hardship and difficulty and suffering, uh, I, I think that's going to cause us to be less than we're made to be. So I, I'm not a guy who wants to build a you know whole culture of suffering. I don't I don't have some kind of weird cult idea in mind. But I do believe that we've got to throw ourselves into uh, the hardships that come our way and see them as redemptive. So you, you end the book, um, and I love this, that there's this ideal of presence in a man or a manly presence. I've, can you describe what that means? Because I, I, I know I've, I've seen men who've embodied that, but what do you ma- mean by a manly presence? Well, probably the best way for me to explain it is to tell briefly the story I told in the book, and that is that I had the privilege in college of spending the day with John Wooden, famous coach from UCLA. And I, there were many things he said to me and taught me that day uh, as, as he saw high college so was sophomore. But the, but the main thing I noticed was uh, him having been a champion athlete, being this noble and famed coach, uh, and having lived and having built all that really uh, on certain solid principles. It emanated in his life. It was a presence. It was something strong that emanated from him. I don't mean anything occult or weird here. I didn't see some aura, you know, wafting off of him. But he had, he, he, there was a presence. And I, I'm, I mean, this is going to sound very mystical, but he would walk into a room and I would see people with their backs to him sort of straighten up and turn around to see what had changed about their immediate environment. We went down to the big basketball arena at my college and, um, you know the the basketball team was practicing down there, and they all stopped playing and turned in our direction. We had walked in from a direction that that nothing usually happens, and some of the players just started walking over in our direction, and finally they they saw John Wooden, and of course were thrilled. But but he had a presence. It changed my life. Um, it was a combination of authority. Uh, and uh, sort of a favor, sort of a positive, you like this guy kind of thing. Um, but it was a weightiness. I think the main thing to say about it is when he walked in the room, there was a gentleness and a love, but there was gravitas, weightiness. There was authority. He wa- he's a small man, by the way. I'm six four and a half. Uh, he was a small man, and so I dwarfed him physically. But that had nothing to do with it. You wanted to get down on your knees and ask him to teach you, and it's because he simply – carried with him something that you felt beyond just looking at him. And I think that's what a man has when he steps up to his responsibilities, walks in the ways of noble manhood, um, and, and exercises his, his authority and strength in a, in a righteous and virtuous way. I think it emanates from his life. And briefly, very, very briefly, I'll tell you that I used to, my daughter used to go to a school where I had to pick her up. And she said, Dad, it's very strange. When you walk in the door and a boy is talking to me, uh, he'll have his back to you. But when you walk in the door, this great big room, uh, they, uh, this boy, the, some, some of the boys I'm talking to will change. They'll, they'll kind of get, more, get gentler. Maybe some of them get a little bit more polite. She said one boy actually called me ma'am and then got all confused and looked at me embarrassed because he, he just felt, I think, she said, I think they feel your presence without seeing you. And I think, well, of course, of course, you know, I'm, I'm her father. I prayed for her, you know, disciplined her, raised her, and uh, yeah, I have authority for her life. I think that's how it works. But this is something you can't fake, right? Like this is something you can't do, like you know, stand up straight and like wear certain clothes and then talk. Like this is not something you can sort of acquire through artificial means. It, t- it requires you living a life of virtue and integrity. Yeah, I think it's spiritual, and I think that what men are sometimes trying to do is recreate that in a natural sense. I mean, I'm not picking on how anybody dresses or looks or whether they have tats or piercings or whatever. I don't care. But but some guys, you know, are trying to compensate for the lack of gravitas and authority in their life by, you know, sort of developing a commanding style or something. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, John Wooden was dressed rather blandly. Uh, he was smaller than I was. There was nothing about him to commend him physically. Um, but he commanded without moving a muscle every place he was because he was John Wooden with all that history, with all that, you know, everything from, from prayer to practice to devotion to love, all of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not something that you can fake. It's not something you can recreate naturally. It's something that comes from living the life a man is supposed to live. All right. Well, Stephen, this has been a fantastic discussion. Where can we learn more about your book and your work? 
Uh, best place to connect with me is stephenmansfield.tv, and from there, all the Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Instagram, everything is Mansfield Rights. Just Mansfield Rights, one word. So I'd, I'd love to hear from everybody. Fantastic. Well, Stephen Mansfield, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Brett, great to be with you. Thanks for all that you're doing, too. Thank you. Our guest today was Stephen Mansfield. He's the author of the book, Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, and you can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. And for more information about Stephen's work, go to stephenmansfield.com. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you haven't already, please check out store.artofmanliness.com. It's our online store full of Art of Manliness swag. We've got a cool coffee mug, uh, a journal inspired by Ben Franklin's Virtue Journal, posters featuring Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, and we just included or just added this uh, cardboard skull that's a puzzle. You put it together and when you're done, you put it on your shelf and will serve as a memento mori art piece so you can meditate upon death and try to live life with a bit more vigor. If you don't know what memento mori is, look it up on our site. It's a type of art that has a very fascinating history. Go there. Your purchases will support the podcast as well as the content we produce on artofmanliness.com. So until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Stay manly.